Hello and welcome to Alien Perspective. On this channel, I talk about politics, political psychology, and autism. So subscribe so you don't miss out. The psychology of transphobia. What's going on in these people's heads? What are the psychological tendencies that lead someone to becoming a transphobe? I'd like to cut through some defensiveness right now because I don't want people to just knee-jerk reject whatever I'm saying. Every human is prone to every psychological tendency I will be discussing in this video. And that includes me, despite always being pro-trans on policy, despite always being affirming and nice in an interpersonal sense. You go back just a few years, and I had a little bit of that transphobia in me too. Now I happen to grow out of it, but you know. All of my sources are in the video description box. Let's get into it. We start at the base, the base of the brain, the base of the mind, the first emotion that animals feel, and that's fear. Fear of change and fear of the unknown are obviously huge components of transphobia. Uh, in fact, when, uh, when I was doing the prep for this video, I was going around and asking people, you know, asking friends, asking family, asking random people on the elevator, what do you think causes transphobia? And overwhelmingly, I got two answers. The first one was a lack of empathy, and we will get into that. It's a little different than you might expect. And the second answer was fear. It was either fear of change or fear of the unknown. But why? Why do we have this fear of change? Well, fundamentally, all animals, with the exception of humans, pretty much all animals fill a particular niche. They have one or two food sources, they have a particular type of terrain that they inhabit. And so, change to an animal that lives that kind of a rigid lifestyle means chaos, means upheaval, likely means some sort of environmental disaster that has strained their food source, strained their shelter, strained them in some sort of I need to survive kind of way. And because we weren't made by a computer, we have retained these primitive fear of change instincts. You know, if you were an alien studying humans, right, you'd, you'd expect there to be like a spectrum, right, of sensitivity of fear, and on the extreme end, on the one end, one end of the extreme, You'd get people who are more sensitive to fear, who feel fear more intensely, who feel fear more frequently, who feel fear when it just is not the appropriate kind of response. Such as fearing gender identity changing. We see this irrational fear of the unknown play out into studies into racism, for example, that show undeniably that you are more likely to be racist if you live in a homogenous, for example, all-white suburb, all-white rural area, as opposed to a diverse city. Living around people of different races lowers the chance of you being racist. I remember when I was growing up, there was this huge wave of people who went from being anti-gay to, oh, I actually know someone who's gay. My son's gay. My niece is gay. My best friend is gay. Maybe I'm gay. And then they, oh, oh, gay people are just like everyone else. And then the homophobia declines. You think transphobia is any different? How many transphobes fear what they are ignorant of? How many transphobes don't know the process of transitioning? How many transphobes know that it can take months and months and months, if not years, of talking with a doctor, psychologist, other specialists, just to get on puberty blockers? How many transphobes know that puberty blockers have been used since the 70s. You know, one thing that reduced my transphobia was learning that puberty blockers are reversible. So if you take puberty blockers for years and years and years, and at the age of 16, 17, 18 years old, you decide, you know what? I don't think transition's right for me. And you go off the puberty blockers and bam, puberty hits you like a freight train with no permanent side effects. You just go through the normal puberty that you would have gone through. Instead of it taking years and years, it takes, you know, months. When I learned that, my transphobia almost died completely. How many transphobes know how rare detransition is? And how many transphobes know that the number one and number two reasons for detransitioning are lack of support from people around them and money? It's not from people who want to detransition, it's people who feel that they're forced to detransition. And how many transphobes don't know just how low the rate of regret is on bottom surgery. So I just learned this recently. Every surgery has a rate of regret. I remember I was, when I was doing the research for this, I saw like there was an old people spinal correction injury surgery that had like a 20% regret rate. There was surgeries for cancers and that one was a 14% regret rate. I believe that that was a meta-analysis. I looked at a meta-analysis for regret of bottom surgery for trans people. It is 1%. In fact, it's less than 1%, which is, I think, the lowest rate of regret for any surgery that I could possibly find. I could go on and spend the rest of this video just asking all the things that transphobes are, are ignorant of. Uh, you know, trans people have always existed throughout history. Always. 
how many transphobes know that? Um, but ultimately, what I could say for a fact is that if everyone in the country knew everything that I had just said about trans people, transphobia would plummet. There are transphobes out there who genuinely fear for the, the well-being of trans people. They're just so horribly misinformed. I will admit, though, sadly, de-ignorancing people would not fully fix the problem, because let's get real, a lot of bigots out there do not have human well-being as a priority. But when you do know better, when you do know better, it really makes the Tucker Carlson's and the Matt Walsh's of the world look either irrationally fearful or manipulative of their audience. Manipulating their audience's fears for the sake of money. Because fear sells, fear gets ratings. You could see this fear of the unknown mixed with their ignorance and fear of change revealed when a transphobe talks about you know, trans people, it's not natural. And it's obvious from the existence of trans people. I mean, trans people have always existed, right? Um, it's, it's clear that they're mixing what they're familiar with with what is natural. So to them, they didn't grow up knowing that trans people existed. Therefore, trans people only existed starting in like 2014. Oh, the planes. Oh, the planes. This is why I think it's essential for schools to teach that trans people exist and have always existed and that being trans is valid and okay. Because quite frankly, there are some people who if they don't have that knowledge growing up, will grow up to be the kinds of people who refuse to update their thinking. And in the case of transphobia, they take on policy positions that are dehumanizing, to say the least. Oh God, I just think it's so stupid, the idea of trans people are natural. I just think it's so stupid. Okay, listen, okay. I think it's really valuable to look at politics from, from what I call the alien perspective, right? It's looking at politics, trying to remove yourself from cultural assumptions, trying to remove yourself from bias, and, and truly look at it as if you're an alien. And if there were aliens studying humans, one of the, one of the things you would notice very quickly is humans are very diverse, right? We've got all sorts of different skin tones, we've got all sorts of different body types, and you would notice pretty quickly, okay, there's this bimodal sexual characteristics, and then there are these gendered norms that strongly correlate with biological sex. And it just seems so obvious to me that there would be some humans for which biological sex and the gendered role are flipped. Okay, sticking with fear of change, you can actually see this reflected in how progressives and conservatives view morality. So progressives see morality, largely speaking, as how we treat one another. And conservatives, largely speaking, see morality as following tradition. You follow the thing that we are familiar with. You move the rock and read the pages of the ancient book and you follow them. And I'm sure you can see how transphobia fits right into that. I kind of touched on this a minute ago, but fear of change also includes fear of changing your mind, fear of admitting that you were ignorant, fear of admitting, hmm, maybe I was wrong about something. Fear of changing your mindset. <laughs> oh God. I don't know if I'm going to keep this in, but, but, but uh, there's also this kind of fear of the unknown or fear of the unexpected where uh, you just know that some transphobes are afraid of being attracted to some girl and then she flops out an enormous penis. I'm sure that's part of transphobia too. All right, moving on. Okay, we're sticking with the amygdala. We're sticking with the reptile brain because it also manages, regulates, it feels, senses, disgust. The point is it connects with disgust. Fear and disgust work similarly in that it is evolutionary advantageous to have a little too much fear or a little too much disgust as opposed to the opposite. So if you're a hunter-gatherer and you're in the forest and you hear rustling behind you, if you're on the more fearful than needed end of the spectrum, then that means you will look behind you and sometimes discover, oh, it's just wind. But if you're on the opposite, if you're more dull to fear and you don't look behind you, Sometimes a lion's gonna eat you and disgust works similarly if you're a little too dull to disgust You're more likely to eat rotten food that poisons your system and kills you And so it's not surprising that as our brain has advanced that we have retained this kind of disgust and That it's manifesting in these negative and irrational ways uh, um, It's tough to talk about disgust in this context because I don't want any trans person to internalize this You know, it's one thing for people to be irrationally afraid of you, it's a bit worse for people to be irrationally disgusted by you. But I'd be naive in thinking that any trans person isn't already aware of this. 
And it would be wrong of me to not include this because it is an important component of transphobia. What I hope that I've established with this segment is that transphobes are transphobic in large part because they're operating more out of the more primitive reptile brain. They're letting these gut feelings dominate their ability to reason. Instead of starting with facts and adjusting their thinking, what transphobes do is they start with their reptile brain feelings and they work backwards by finding anti-trans arguments that conform to their feelings. All right, new segment. We're gonna adjust the iris aperture. Yeah, iris aperture, whatever it's called. Empathy or lack thereof. Got to talk about it. Too often, when empathy is brought up in a political discussion, conservatives, right-wingers, they frame empathy as like, oh, you're just being a soft soy boy lip cuck, bro. When in reality, empathy is the bedrock of emotional intelligence. The ability to project yourself into somebody else's lived experience, their circumstances, their perspective, that is one of the things that separates us as humans from lower animals. For years, there was this debate between some studies that showed that conservatives have less empathy than left-leaning people and other studies that showed, no, that everyone has the same capacity for empathy. And over time, the studies have become more nuanced. And what we now understand is that while left-leaning and right-leaning people have the same capacity for empathy, it's that conservatives have a more narrow scope of empathy. So if they haven't personally experienced something, it's much more difficult for them to have empathy for it. I'm sure you can see how this is linked to transphobia. Overall, transphobes are less emotionally competent. So emotional competence means identifying emotions, reacting appropriately to those emotions, and knowing how to regulate those emotions. And I really want to emphasize this. These emotional abilities are a form of intelligence. So I'm quoting now from a neurology study, quote, avoidance of painful emotions is often the motivating force in negative behaviors such as substance abuse, binge eating, and suicide. Those actions are taken as a maladaptive approach to control, avoid, or regulate painful emotions. That was a paper regarding the anterior cingulate cortex. I had to research what that part of the brain was all about because in the same study that showed that conservatives, particularly far-right people, have a larger and more sensitive amygdala, which is the fear receptor, people on the right also have a smaller and less active anterior cingulate cortex, which helps regulate emotions, helps you with emotional incompetence. Excuse me, helps you with emotional competence. <laughs> It helps you with regulating, understanding your emotions, self inside all these things. Being emotionally incompetent is a strong predictor of prejudice. Let me illustrate how. So there are tons of people who feel that they're going nowhere with their job, who have an unfulfilling marriage, maybe a difficult relationship with their kids, uh, maybe they're having some sexual dysfunction, maybe they're getting older and they have death anxiety, or maybe they just have a dick boss and they feel powerless. And instead of recognizing what I just mentioned as being the sources of their grievance, of their anxiety, of their pain, they throw their negativity onto a scapegoat, which of course does not fix the underlying unhappiness. By the way, everything I just said applies to racism. It applies to all forms of bigotry. Now, we're gonna synthesize some information, all right? Pair up being more sensitive to fear with having fewer internal resources to competently handle it. There are rational things to fear, such as bears, and there are irrational things to fear, such as trans people. I want this to be a little subsection here, okay? So people hate it when they're made to feel less than. I think we can all intuitively understand that. Do I really need to study to prove that? Um, we all know that bigotry is bad and reflects that you're stupid, and people who are bigoted often don't like being called out for being bigots. And instead of being emotionally competent, instead of having the courage to look inward and go, hmm, you know what? Maybe this criticism that somebody's giving towards me, maybe maybe they're right. Maybe, maybe I need to change. Instead of that, in this case, the transphobe gets defensive, feels like they're just being name called and can't break out of feeling like the person's just trying to insult them. They can't move to the next step of questioning. If there's any lesson to take home from this segment, it's that transphobes for all their posturing about how you know it's just, you're just being all feels based and being accepting bro uh the irony is that they are in fact the ones who are over emotional and irrationally so 
One of the conservative psychological tendencies that feeds into transphobia is an aversion to nuance and a tendency to think in black and white terms. You can see this in the most obvious example, gender versus sex. If you think in a black and white way, they are the same. If you think in a nuanced way, you understand that gender and sex are two different words that have two definitions that refer to two different things. You can see this simple-mindedness in uh, turf arguments. So for example, yeah, trans women aren't real women because they don't have the same experience as real women. Which, if you take like two seconds to think about, you could see the fatal flaws in this line of argument, right? First off, pretty sexist to assume that all women have the same experience. And more importantly, is the difference in experience between a cisgendered person and a trans person really greater than the difference between a rich person and a poor person? I don't know, man. I live in America, and I gotta say, I think the difference is a little bit bigger on class lines. Would you say that a rich woman isn't a real woman because they haven't experienced all of the other things that real women experience? Hmm. Hmm. But see, if you start from the position, I don't like trans people, I don't want trans women to be considered women, then you hear that turf argument, and it goes, okay, I, that conforms to how I feel, turn off brain, no analyzing from here on out, transphobia continues. Another example is the litter box story. So you remember the the idea was, is like Joe Rogan's friend of a friend of a friend knew a teacher that had to install a litter box in the classroom, allegedly, because a parent complained that their child identified as a furry and therefore needed a litter box to pee in. Now, if you just think about that for two seconds, you'll realize it is so irrational to think that a parent would call up a school so that their kid can pee in front of the rest of the class. That is so nonsensical. What parent would do that? Now, of course, in reality, the reason why a litter box was being set up was in the case of an active shooter, in case the kids had to go to the bathroom, they wouldn't have to soil their pants. You know, on one level, transphobia is obviously immoral because it leads to bad outcomes. You know, transphobia leads to higher rates of depression and suicide amongst trans people. But beyond that, on another level, it's just immoral to be transphobic because it's immoral to just be f***ing stupid. We have, as humans, the most complex system in the entire universe in our head, and I just think it's immoral not to use it. I genuinely wonder if some transphobes are transphobic because trans people challenge them to think in a more nuanced way, challenge them to use a little bit of brain power to change their mind, and it's like, it's like they hate the people that require them to think. Waiting for the plane to go by, waiting for the plane to go by. Fredly, everyone, waiting for the plane. One thing I'd really like to establish is causality. So you'll hear the you'll hear the cliche, you know, correlation does not equal causation, which is true. For pretty much everything I've discussed in this video, I will make the argument that the causal arrow works both directions. So it's not just that being more fearful leads you to being transphobic. It's that being transphobic leads you to being more fearful. Watching media that fear mongers about trans people only works on you if you're transphobic and it trains your brain to think in a more fearful way because it's activating those parts of the brain more. Think about the brain like a muscle. Emotional incompetence works the same way. If you're emotionally incompetent, it's gonna lead you to be, well, will more likely lead you to be transphobic, but being transphobic also leads you to being more emotionally incompetent because instead of actually addressing the grievances, the pain, the problems you have in your life, you're scapegoating it on trans people. And this mental laziness works the same way. Wait, hold on. There was like an actual academic, what was it called? Oh my God, what was the paper? What did it call it? It was low effort thought. Low effort thought, the, the politically correct way of saying conservatives are mentally lazy. It's not just that being mentally lazy, thinking in black and white ways, makes you more transphobic. It's that to retain that transphobia, you have to continue thinking in black and white, lacking in nuance, overly simplistic ways. And it reinforces thinking that way. And it, again, it trains your brain to think in a particular way. God, we're so close. Come on, we're so close. Come on, we're so close. Come on, Blake, get the f*** out of here. Ah! Let's talk about authoritarianism. This is something, overall, when it comes to political psychology, I find fascinating. It's something that, that I studied quite a bit in grad school. 
Um, here's the mental image you should have: the uh, the 20 to 25 percent most extreme right wing people in the country. All right, the the people trying to use the power of the state effectively to stop trans people from being trans, to halt freedom of expression, to stop people from getting health care, to stop parents from giving health care to their children. And don't give me this, oh, I'm just defending traditional values. You want to use the power of the state to force people to express themselves in a way that doesn't trigger you. That is authoritarianism, period. Another way to think about authoritarianism is this, okay? So imagine conservatism is like the base game, all right? Authoritarianism is the DLC, it's the expansion. So you get every feature of normal conservatism with some added bonus features. And they're just lovely features. I promise you, every one of them is great. God, my legs! Oh my god! One of the symptoms of the authoritarian personality is a preoccupation with toughness and power, which I'm sure is the most surprising thing. Authoritarians are obsessed with power. This is in part a politically correct way of saying that authoritarians are afraid of being perceived as weak. I've heard people on the right say, oh, transphobia ain't the right word, bro. I'm not afraid of trans people. As if, as if their image of a phobia is like a trans person walking down the street and their reaction is, <laughs> In reality, one of their greatest fears is that their kid will be trans. And the fear that they have is a fear of emasculation. And because their kid at least in their mind, is an extension of themselves. If, the, if their kid is trans, well, then they themselves are emasculated. Many people have been trained by our culture into thinking that if a man... I, I, again, we're using their... Anyone with a penis is a man in their view, okay? So I'm, I'm sorry, I know that that's not pro-trans, but in their mind, that anyone that's a man that behaves feminine is therefore weak. And sadly, they're too close-minded and they're too rigidly minded and they're too afraid of change. To change their mindset. And uh, I, <laughs> I don't really know how else to say this, but authoritarians are just weird about sex. All right, while the plane's going by, I'm going to adjust the camera a little bit there. There we go. That's a little better. They're animalistically rigid about it. You know, only man and woman. You know, man takes dominant role. Woman has this genitalia. It's very black and white brained. There's this weird thing about authoritarians and control over sex. I swear, these are the people that invented monogamy. I want to stick with, with power here for a moment, right? Because because people feel powerless for, for so many reasons in this society. Most of them are capitalism related. And some of, some percentage of people respond to that by wanting power over others. Or to be part of a group that has power over others. Call this confederate soldier who doesn't own a slave, but fights and dies for white supremacy syndrome. And the same goes for miserable people who just want to spread their misery onto others. I think of the, I think of the grandma from Sopranos, who just, just every nice thing that comes her way, she's got to find some flaw in it, some way to reject it, you know. I, I don't expect happiness, Anthony. And trans people are targeted, in part because they're the trendy outgroup to spread misery and, and d d power control. You get what I'm saying, right? Another aspect of authoritarianism is conformity, probably for obvious reasons. It's this it's dumb monkey brain hatred of difference. You know, I'm not sure to what extent it's about fear of difference versus desire for control, though uh, I guess control can be an emotionally incompetent way of trying to handle fear, right? You know, if everyone acts the way I want them to act, they won't be a threat. I don't know, man, let's get real. Part of transphobia is just, what if I'm attracted to somebody and they have a penis? Does that mean I'm gay? Oh my god, people are gonna think I'm gay. Fear, 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 fear. Overall, sexual insecurity is huge. Fascist movements, authoritarian right-wing movements throughout history have relied on a steady crop of sexually insecure men. Part of conformity is that some people are transphobic simply because they want to fit in with the group that they're in, and they just happen to be part of a group, maybe it's a church group, that is transphobic. And instead of some deep resentment or hatred of the different other people, it's more of a, okay, I'll, I'll just go along with it because the people around me are doing it. And an extension of that is being submissive to the narratives of authority. How many transphobes didn't know they were supposed to hate trans people until Fox News told them to. Oh god, how many transphobes even knew that trans people existed before Fox News told them? One thing that has been found over and over again is that people with an authoritarian personality lack self-insight, likely because they lack emotional competence, and because they lack the courage to look inward. They lack the courage to introspect. And as a result, a lot of them are alienated from who they really are inside. Part of the whole in-group, out-group preference thing it's about searching for their own identity. It just amazes me 
that part of people's identity is being white. You know how some people, like their personality is, I like Star Wars and that's their personality? There's some people where it's like, I'm white and that's their personality. The same thing works with transphobia. You know, they aren't one of those trans people. It is an incompetent and stupid way of forming an identity. Kind of amazing, but it's true. So yeah, uh, how do I want to end this? Um, you know, if you came to this video with any level of transphobia, whether it was, you know, you were like me just a few years ago, you got that little bit of transphobia in you, or whether you're full-on bigot mode. And I hope your takeaway is, oof, the psychological tendencies that lead to transphobia, they are not pretty. Transphobes are stupid, fearful, irrational, authoritarian, bad at coping, lacking in nuance, mentally lazy, and most importantly, primitively minded dominated by their primitive reptile brain feelings. And I hope you think, I don't want to be like that. So that's my alien perspective. If you think I missed anything, please comment below. If there's a political psychology topic you'd like me to discuss, please comment below. And give this video a like, and, and please subscribe, and please share the video. Oh my god, I spent so much time doing research, filming this th two different times. So, uh, yeah, please show me some love. So yeah, I think I'm done.